Amen. Well, uh, good morning to everybody today. And uh, uh, open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. And uh, before we get started, I have a modern day parable to read to all of you guys. Come on, bro. So the parable is called The Perfect Hearts. It says, One day, a young man was standing in the middle of the town, proclaiming that he had the most beautiful heart in the whole valley. A large crowd gathered, and they all admired his heart, for it was perfect. There was not a mark or a flaw in it. Yes, they all agreed it truly was the most beautiful heart they had ever seen. The young man was very proud and boasted more loudly about his beautiful heart. Suddenly an old man appeared in front of the crowd and said, Why, your heart is not nearly as beautiful as mine. The crowd and the young man looked at the old man's heart. It was beating strongly, yet full of scars. It had places where pieces had, had been removed and other pieces put in. But they didn't quite fit right, and there were several jagged edges. In fact, some places, there were deep holes where entire pieces were missing. The people stared. How could he say his heart is more beautiful, they thought. The young man looked at the old man's heart, saw it state, and laughed. You must be joking, he said. How can you compare your heart with mine? Mine is perfect. Yours is a mess of scars and tears. Yes, the old man said, yours is perfect looking, but I would never trade hearts with you. You see, every scar represents a person to whom I have given my heart. I tear out a piece of mine and I give it to them. And often they give me a piece of their heart which fits into the empty place in mine. But because the pieces aren't exact, yeah, I have some rough edges, which I cherish because they remind me of the love we shared. Sometimes I have given pieces of my heart away, and the other person hasn't returned a piece of their heart to me. Wow. Or perhaps they have ripped away the piece they once gave. These are the empty gouges, you see. Giving your heart means taking a chance. Although these gouges are painful... They stay open, reminding me of the love I have for these people too. And I hope someday they may return and fill the space I have waiting for them in my heart. So do you see what a beautiful heart truly is? The young man stood silently with tears running down his cheeks. He walked up to the old man, reached into his perfect heart, his perfect young and flawless heart and ripped a piece out. He offered it to the old man with trembling hands, for this was the first time he had ever really offered his heart. The old man took his offering, placed it in his heart, and took a piece of his old scarred heart and placed it in the wound of the young man's heart. It fits, but not perfectly, as there were some jagged edges. The young man looked at his heart, no longer perfect, but more beautiful than ever, ever since the love from the old man's heart flowed into his. How sad it must be to go through life with a whole untouched heart. Wow. The title of the lesson today is The Perfect Heart. I have three points for you this morning. Point number one is a heart for the lost. Point number two, a heart for the saved. And point number three, a heart for for the mission. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 is where we will take our first point from. Starting in verse 1, the Bible says, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We have previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi. As you know, with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. 
We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know, we, use, we never use flattery, nor do we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, amen, Shannon? Uh, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. You see, Paul's saying here, although we were mistreated in Philippi, uh, Mike read a, 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 a passage from Philippians, right? About how uh, basically they were uh, sharing with, um, uh, with Paul uh, basically monetary gifts so he can continue to advance the gospel, right? So what Paul's saying is while he was in Philippi, he was mistreated by non-Christians. Um, and then he goes to Corinthians and the Philippian church continues to support him. But still there, he's receiving opposition. And said, so because of God, because of his faith in God, they dared to speak the gospel. They dared to share their faith with other people. You know, it's difficult to really continue to give your heart over and over and over to people uh, just to be let down. Uh, I know here in Brooklyn, we've had a number of people that we've studied the Bible with and, and have decided to turn their backs on the message, on the gospel. But we invest a lot of time teaching them the Word of God, pouring our hearts out to them. And, and it hurts when, when they rip that piece of their heart back and say, I don't want this. Uh, and so, unfortunately, for some of us, that means we stop really giving our hearts to people we study the Bible with. Or for some of us, maybe we stop sharing our faith altogether. But that's not the example we get from Jesus when it says he offered his heart when he died for you while you were still sinners in Romans 5.8. Uh, we have to continue to offer our hearts to people. We can't say, uh, you know, let's just get you through these Bible studies. And if you decide to become a Christian, then I'll give you my heart. That's just not the way that Jesus did it. In fact, that same love that the Bible talks about, uh, the same love that Jesus gives is what must inspire us to give our hearts freely. Uh, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And Paul gives us a great example of how the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus and his love and sacrifice must motivate us to share our faith. 2 Corinthians 5, and verse, starting in verse 13. If we are out of our mind, as some say, and some of us that sometimes may seem like we're out of our minds, right? It is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised from the dead. See, the cross must be what compels us as disciples. You know, for me, uh, I'm eternally grateful for the men who, who freely gave their heart and their lives to me uh, to really teach me the truth about the Bible. Uh, see, I grew up religious. I grew up believing that there was a God. I grew up believing that you know, I was uh, okay, I was saved because of different things I had kind of adopted from different people along the way. Uh, but three men particularly sat me down and loved me enough to speak the truth to me. Uh, and, and they would study the Bible with me. And, and uh, I remember one of these guys uh, was like, uh, basically, I'm going to speak the truth in love no matter how it makes you feel. You know, uh, I don't, I'm not going to uh, powder coat this. I'm not going to give it to you fluffy. This is what the Bible says. You're not saved. You're going to hell. And I want to help you change your life. Wow. And about halfway through the discipleship study, I was completely done with this guy. I'm like, dude, thank you so much. Have a nice day. I'm out of here. Right. right? Uh, but, but that man grew, went on to become my mentor. He went on to become one of my best friends ever in the whole entire world. And I'm so grateful for the fact that he told it to me straight uh, because that's true love is when you get in someone's face and tell them what they're doing wrong. 
Uh, the, another one of the guys was just like this complete uh, compassionate person. Uh, he, he just was the kind of person that was patient, uh, would hear you out, and, and if you, uh, you know, what you said didn't match the Bible, he would very, uh, you know, uh, politely sit you down and explain to you from the scriptures why you were an heir. And, and I needed him to reel me back in, right? Because, because I didn't want to listen to... Uh, you know, the straightforward side, side of uh, things. But uh, although I needed that to wake me up. Yeah. Uh, the third guy that studied the Bible with me was the definition of persistence. <laughs> this guy, when I was completely done, called me every single day for two weeks wow. without me answering the phone, asking me, hey, let's get back together. Let's continue to study the Bible and not go on opinions, but go on the Word of God. And so, uh, you know, he, he called me up every single day. I decided one day, two weeks later, to answer the phone. And he just wouldn't take no for an answer. Uh, he, he's like, hey, why don't you come over for a Bible study? And I'm like, no. You know, uh, it, it's funny because I was 19 years old at the time. It's 7 p.m. at night, and my excuse was I was going to bed because I was tired, right? So, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm, for some reason, he didn't buy that. Um, so then he's like, you know what? Okay, you're tired. I'll come over to your house. And I'm like, uh, yeah, but I'm going to bed, remember? You know, and then he's like, oh, come on, man. I'll bring dinner. And I'm like, come on over, baby. <laughs> so anyways, he, he was able to come over. He brought the, the compassionate guy. And I let him have everything I had of why I was saved. And they, they very patiently... Uh, brought me to the scriptures and helped me see the error of my ways. And I'm thankful for them to this day. Because they gave me their hearts without reserve. They were willing to be hurt because uh, of whatever my response would have been. If I would have continued to pull my heart away. But they sacrificed and they had faith in God that I was going to return my heart to them as well. Let's make sure that as we give our hearts, we give freely in spite of being hurt. And that faith that in God, that as we offer pieces of our hearts to the lost, that they'll offer a piece of their hearts back to us as well. Turn with me to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Our second point is a heart for the saved. You know we got to go here. Many of us know the scripture very well. But in verse 34 of John chapter 13, Jesus says, A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. You know, first and foremost... This is a command directly from Jesus himself. Love one another. Love other disciples. This is how the rest of the world will see that you're different. Yeah. Well, bro, that's easy. Because I love everyone in my own special way. <laughs> so, you know, Jesus' command is not wishy-washy here, right? Uh, it's one thing to say, you know what, uh, Mike, I want you to love uh, Gerald, right? Okay, cool. Yeah, I can totally love Gerald. No, 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 Mike. I want you to love Gerald like Jesus loves Gerald. Wow, wow. That's a whole matter, a whole different matter altogether. Yeah. We're not called to simply love each other. We're called to love like Jesus loves with a sacrificial love. Yeah. For example, I always love my wife, Amelia. She's my best friend. We have a lot of fun together. It's incredible, but I don't always love her like Jesus loves her. So you know how I know this? Because sometimes I'm just a little bit selfish. Sometimes my needs and my desires come first. Because, I, you know, I just want such and such. Sometimes I'm a little bit arrogant. Case in point, let me tell you about last night. So, so last night we got home kind of late. We went to uh, Noble and Tylea's uh, uh, engagement party. Come on. Uh, and then on the way home, we, we decided we need some groceries. We need to go grocery shopping. So we got home at like 11.30 p.m., right? 
And, and we're like, man, we gotta put these groceries away, we gotta do dishes. So I started putting the groceries away, and she did the dishes. And I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you, baby, for doing the dishes. But although last night I wasn't very grateful, because she got done doing the dishes, and I began to walk over to the sink and nitpick a bit. Oh, so were you going to leave the food in the strainer in the bottom of the sink? Or were you going to leave the sponge the way that I don't like it? And, and, and she come over and, and oh, uh, you know, I, I forgot. I'm sorry. You know, and I'm like, but you do this every time. It's always like this. You, don't, you can't say you forget if you always do it. And, 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 <laughs> and so I woke up this morning. And, and, and I realized I needed to apologize to my wife and, and, and did. And, baby, again, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I do love you very much. I try to love you like Jesus loved, but I need that little help sometimes. So. Thank you for being patient with me, bearing with me. Amen. But we got to love like Jesus loves. We can't love how we choose to love. It's got to be a sacrificial love. And certainly if we're commanded to love in this way, it must be sincere. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Paul gives us a little more insight to this kind of love. Love the lost, love the saved. Romans chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 9. And Paul simply says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual ser- fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Amen. The number one reason we fail to love like Jesus is that we don't honor others above ourselves. There should never be quarrels among disciples, among true disciples of Jesus. These only happen because our love is not sincere. You know, we just need to be right. You ever feel like, man, I've got to be right. And I know I'm right and I'm going to prove it. And because we're unwilling and unyielding, to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, Ephesians 5.21. We have these quarrels, we have these arguments amongst believers who are unified by the Spirit of God. Verse 12, Paul says, To be joyful in hope. Hope for unity through the Spirit. Patient in affliction. And when someone wrongs you, it means you don't feel the need to retaliate. That you can be patient with that person. And faithful in prayer. Praying that God will either change their heart or yours, whoever's really in the wrong. And move your heart to change. You know, we must quickly get past our own pride and give up our right to be right. Uh, Obviously, unless it's a biblical matter, then we allow the Bible to be right. Amen? Uh, But we need to really love each other. To love each other, remember, not like we want to love each other, but with a sacrificial love like Jesus Christ. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 28. We'll get to our last point. A heart for the mission. Are you willing to give pieces of your heart freely to others? In Matthew 28, we're going to start in verse 16. This is uh, Jesus' final words before he leaves the earth. And he's talking to his disciples and giving them his final instructions. In verse 16, it says, The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Point number three, a heart for the mission. You see here the command is simple. Jesus charges every generation 
to evangelize the whole world. Our charge is the same today as if we were physically standing on the mountaintop with Jesus. Go make disciples of all nations, baptize them, teach them everything. You know, Mike uh, shared in the contribution, he says he's got 24 years left. Hopefully, you know, bro, I might have a few more years than you. Uh, but the call is the same for myself, the call is the same for Mike and each one of you. In our generation, we need to fight to see this world evangelized. Here in Brooklyn and around the world. You know, you could certainly do like the first century disciples here did. Uh, you can go home. You can pack a bag, sell everything else. You can go throughout the nations proclaiming the gospel. You can live homeless and poor and most likely be martyred for the gospel. That may be what God has planned for you. Yeah. Who knows? <clears throat> but the fact is, we can do that or we can be like the Corinthian churches. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. <laughs> this is the model that we practice today most, m more than uh, not. Um, the Corinthian church, the Macedonian church, and the culture we have today. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1. Paul says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches in the midst of a very severe trial. Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability entirely on their own. They urged and pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of, the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. You see, Paul compares our financial sacrifice with others, uh, uh, to others with Jesus' sacrifice to give the comforts of heaven to come to earth and be mistreated so that we can become spiritually rich yeah. and have a relationship with God. Uh, I, I do have a letter from uh, Luke Speckman. Uh, uh, for those of you visiting with us, Luke Speckman uh, leads our whole church in New York. Uh, today we meet as, by a region here in Brooklyn. There's regions that we have in Manhattan, the Bronx, Queens, and, and New Jersey as well, uh, all meeting together at the same time. And then we come together in, in Times Square uh, on a regular basis uh, to worship together. And Luke oversees all of, our, all of our regions here. And he wrote a letter about our special missions uh, efforts. Uh, and just so you know as well, uh, basically in the springtime of every year, we, take up, we do a lot of fundraising, take up a uh, missions collection to go to support uh, our churches around the world, primarily the churches in India that we oversee. Uh, but Luke says... Dear New York City Church, greetings on a beautiful Sunday morning. I trust everyone is enjoying meeting in regional services today. Firstly, I would like to thank and commend all you have, who have worked so hard to sacrifice for our special missions efforts this year, as well as those who have sacrificed year after year. Truly, your sacrifice has resulted in thousands of conversions to Christ worldwide, and I thank you. As you are all aware, we gathered on Wednesday evening by regions to go over what level of sacrifice will be needed for our final push to achieve our mission's goal. In Manhattan, we, uh, where I led the midweek, I was blown away by the generosity of the disciples who made decisions on the spot to sacrifice possessions, trips, and comforts 
to reach the goal, many of whom had already given more than they were asked. However, even though, uh, even with this incredible sacrifice, we still had not achieved our goal. This was quite surprising to me because in 2018, the Manhattan region gave almost 150% of its spring missions goal. When I heard reports from the other region leaders, they were all similar to our experience that although uh, there was an incredible sacrifice, not one region had achieved its goal. As a church, our commitments to give were a little over 115,000 short of our goal. I began Thursday morning to have a great quiet time. Then I turned my attention to the matter at hand and spent some time thinking through the solutions. I was rem- and I was reminded of this following scripture. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4. My takeaway from our regional meetings uh, and from individual conversations was that although the church is willing to sacrifice, our goal is simply too daunting to achieve right now. I think much uh, of this is due to the incredible continued sacrifice in our weekly contribution to run our local budget, for which I am very grateful. I believe that if we really wanted to, we could, uh, we could reach our mission's goal. However, I believe that to do so would exasperate many great-hearted disciples and ultimately be counterproductive. Therefore, I do not believe it is wise to add additional pressure for so many to continue giving after they have already gone above and beyond the call. With this in mind, I uh, contacted Matt Sullivan, Michael Kirshner, and Kit McKean with the proposal, and those are uh, guys that help oversee our world missions, uh, uh, both funding and and efforts, uh, with this proposal. I had heard the plan for our fall missions goal was a little smaller than last year. Uh, Also, I've heard that several uh, churches had elected to move 15 to 20 percent of their spring ni- 2019 goal to the fall in order to lessen the burden. I asked if we could do the same, and my request was granted. What this will mean is uh, for us to take approximately 75,000 uh, from our goal and move it to our fall missions. Uh, with the current amount we already uh, need to give and adding the 75000 it would likely have the similar goal to what we had last fall, which is about $800 per person. Uh, <clears throat> we still need to close out the spring missions, and, uh, and we do need to collect what was uh, committed to on Wednesday, as well as an additional 40000 remaining to complete this plan. Uh, this breaks down to about $200 per person, and I provide each region leader with the exact amount needed for each region based on the number of disciples. The additional $200 per person could be given by the individual or collected by Bible Talk or it could be gone after via fundraising efforts. Uh, so in summary, these are the practicals I am asking for. Number one, uh, please give what you committed to giving uh, to uh, Wednesday evening uh, midweek. Number two, each region leader should come up with a plan uh, to raise additional $200 per person to close out the spring missions. And number three, everything given beyond uh, what is needed for our church goal uh, will go to reducing the fall missions goal. Uh, My hope is that uh, you will feel a great deal of relief and get behind the updated plan. Thank you all for your partnership in the gospel. Much love, Luke Speckman. Uh, and, and so once again, thank you guys uh, for your continued sacrifice, for your continued efforts. And let's go ahead and bring this to a close, to a completion, like Paul talks about here in the scriptures. Um, and let's close out in verse uh, in verse ten here. Come on, bro. But Paul does call the Corinthian church to bring their special missions to a completion here. And verse 10, he says, And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work, so that your eager, your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means. For if the willingness is there... The gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. You see, the culture of the Corinthian church was to advance the gospel by supporting them by financial means 
and by sharing their faith and evangelizing their local area of Corinth. We have the same charge today. We evangelize strictly in Brooklyn. We want to win Brooklyn for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But we continue to sacrifice. We continue to fundraise so that the less fortunate, church, the less fortunate churches in our fellowship can have their needs met as well and continue to advance the gospel in their area of the world as well. Uh, specifically for us, this means uh, the churches that we oversee in India uh, because that's the, the churches that we directly have uh, uh, basically fellowship with. And so in closing, let's bring our special missions com- uh, to completion. Let's have our hearts, uh, let's give of our hearts freely and completely, first of all, to the lost, second of all, to the saved, and to the mission as well, and to God be the glory.